thank you everyone for coming. Uh, today we have Omar Sosa Sek, which yeah, I sorry. probably butchered his last name, but I apologize. Um, he's uh, uh, from Stamps, and he does work in uh, rhetoric and semiotics <laughs> in interactive systems. I think it's a good summary. Um, he's going to talk to us about delight. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Um, thanks for coming. So my name is Omar, as Matt said, and I'm coming from Stamps. And today, um, we're going to talk about how to use rhetoric um, to talk about delight in interactive systems. So, um, why rhetoric? Well, it's, it's a consequence of my transition from computer science to information design. So when I was in computer science, um, I was focused on things like web usability, um, web design, software analysis and design, um, and image processing and computer vision. And then when I moved to the realm of design, um, I started focusing on design methods, interface design, um, information visualization, corporate identity design, when finding systems, information architecture, and in terms of theory or regarding theory, semiotics and rhetoric. So one thing I'm super fascinated with is like the visual. So the visual is part of my career, and so is design. So that's the common thing I have in my career. But I have or I got um, um, influence of like two like um, people, scholars of design and HCI. Um, on the side of rhetoric, um, I'm talking about the work of Hanoes. He basically like um, brought um, rhetoric into the realm of graphic design. And in the case of HCI, I'm talking about the work of Clarice de Sousa, um, who brought you know, um, semiotics into HCI and built a theory um, based on semiotics. For example, in the case of Hanno, he says, um, from a rhetorical perspective, design for visual communication may be characterized as a multimodal process that adapts and manages signs and symbols in order to influence and coordinate social interaction. So that's kind of the gist, that graphic design or doing graphic design is addressing a situation for a certain audience. And in the case of um, semiotic engineering, um, Clarice de Sousa says, through the system's interface, in many direct and indirect ways, designers are telling the users how they can, should, or must interact with the system in order to achieve a particular range of goals anticipated at design time. So what she's like telling us um, is that we, the designers, are creating messages that we convey through interaction time. So if the user cannot accomplish a goal, that means that our message is not clear enough. And to me, like, the visual matters. Like, the visual is something that we use to shape our reality and to influence our behavior. And I guess, like, these examples are like self-explanatory to some extent. Like in this case, we can see you know, the image of saying like, before you school, mom, maybe you better light up a Mar Marlboro, right? So this is so political and incorrect nowadays, but this is something that we consider like, you know, real or as a truth somehow, like, you know, a couple of decades ago. So my point here is that like, we're exposed to these type of artifacts, and we embrace the meaning that these artifacts are conveying to us. So we need to be more critical as researchers to see how these things generate meaning, and, you know, they affect our perception of reality. So that's my point. Because, I don't know, are like interactive systems different? I believe that it's a similar case. And I always like um, mention the case of Tinder. Um, that if, from my perspective, it has an amazing usable interface, but it, that its influence, you know, ha, um, um, it, it is influencing the way we see and think of dating, and you know how other designers design like similar interfaces. So we know that you know you swipe to the right, you know, if you want to like have a date with that person or you swipe to the left if you don't want to have a date with a person. But also, I want us to consider that 
is fostering the idea that, you know, if you really want to date this person, that's, you know, and you see the person as a hot one, as an attractive mm -hmm. one, that's the right thing. But if you know, like, you know, that feel by that person, it goes to the left. The right is moving forward, is the right thing, and left is, you know, going backwards. So there's like someone there, like, meaning that is, you know, being unfolded, you know, during the user experience that I want us to be super aware of. So, what's my rhetorical, um, what's my perspective, you know, um, in terms of rhetoric? Well, what I'm trying to say today is that, you know, the design of interactive systems is concerned with shaping and arranging um, symbols to persuade, um, identify, invite to understanding, help in self-discovery and self-knowledge, or shape reality. So that's how we can talk about SCI if we consider a um, rhetorical perspective. So why delight? Well, I believe that delight is a strong component of um, human experiences. We are delighted when we open, you know, our Christmas gifts. We are delighted when, you know, like, you know, we're like coming out from a class, we're hungry, and then we smell the food and, you know, eat some tacos right now. We are delighted when we're tired and, you know, we go home and take a warm shower or when we receive a hug from the person we love. So delight is something that affects also our behavior and perception of reality. It's something that, you know, it's worth it, um, worthy of attention. And I believe that it's also like something that we should pay attention in the case of interactive systems. Um, because, you know, one question that we can do is like, what does delight do for us? or to us during the user experience. It's not only about like seeing, seeing this glitterish, you know, like type of effects. It's like, you know, it's, a, it's something that, you know, helps, um, helps us, you know, make decisions or consider, you know, what actions to take or like how to frame a situation. Like in this case, when you type congrats and you see this explosion of confetti, it's somehow telling me that, you know, Congratulating someone is good, um, is good, sorry, or congratulating someone is like something that is, should be festive, or like, you know, or that I did well by like, putting that message. And the system is telling me, you know what? Yeah, I'm with you. Let's celebrate this. So, my take on the lag um, in the case of interactive systems is this. So, I consider the light as an aesthetic um, experiential quality that helps, you know an interactive system to fulfill one of the functions of rhetoric, which are these five. To persuade, identify, invite to understanding, help in self-discovery and self-knowledge or shape reality. So from my perspective, delight, when we try to, you know, we aim at creating delight, is because we're going to fulfill one of these um, functions. Or we want to fulfill one of these functions. So where can we study this rhetorical perspective of delight in SCI? Well, I think that it can be situated in this place, in this intersection. So we can consider some um, aspects of the user experience, particularly, you know, like the things related to pleasure, and also, you know, how aesthetics emerge from using the artifact, in this case, interactive system. But I do prefer that the design orientation of SCI, um, and particularly, you know, uh, the role that humanity <coughs> plays in SCI, the humanistic SCI, and having interaction with criticism and interface criticism as, you know, as a method to generate knowledge in SCI. So in this intersection is where I'm situating the study of the lab. So some aspects that I consider within that space um, um, come from like different perspectives. And of course, talking about emotion is kind of difficult. We understand emotions, we feel emotions, but when we need to articulate them, it's kind of like difficult to do. So a quick first step is like considering, um, you know, dictionary definitions. And we can see that, you know, it means, for example, to please someone great. But um, I'm a native Spanish speaker, so um, the Royal Academy of, um, of, the, of the Spanish language and defines delight as pleasure of the soul or sensual pleasure. 
And that's the notion of delight I grew up with. So to me, that's why delight is so important, because it's something that you really feel inside, that connects to your soul, that comes from the outside world, but it generates within. So, something to consider. And some synonyms of delight, of course, we have um, charm, enchant, captivate, excite, amuse, entertain, thrill, joy, glee, relish, bliss, rapture, ecstasy, and delectation, which I associate with the Spanish definition. So, um, in terms of disciplines, or regarding disciplines, um, I take into account like, you know, some aspects from philosophy, from marketing, from product design, and of course from human-computer interaction. And since I assume that we're more familiar with the latter, so I just want to like, give a glimpse of what I'm, what I'm talking about in this regard. So we have the notion of user experience and this idea from Hasenzal that you know, we have some like, pragmatic and hedonic attributes. So that's something I consider. And of course, that when we design something, we're trying to give a character to our system. But it's not the same character that the user may perceive during interaction time. So we have the inten intended product character and the appearing product character. And since I'm like exploring this um, humanities philosophy space of HCI, I also consider um, the four threads of experience, you know, the sensual, the emotional, the compositional, and the spatiotemporal threads of, the hum of technology as, like, as experience. And like all these ideas uh, that are like um, um, getting formed from the domain called interaction aesthetics, you know, like the idea of like you get an aesthetic quality from using the interactive artifact, um, and that connects um, to the notion of interaction gestalt or interaction design poetics, how to talk about the design elements and how these elements um, um, generate you know, an experiential quality. And um, something that I also consider is the institutional <coughs> model of pleasure, um, which says that pleasure is something that we construct socially. We can talk about pleasure because we learn socially what pleasure means. And I think that's a very important um, like thing for us to keep in mind. From philosophy, um, we have uh, some ideas that have, and in this case, these ideas have shaped my perception of delight and pleasure as well. For example, pleasure tells us whether an experience is good. Pleasure has an ethical role in our experiences. Pleasure helps us to do things and do them well. Pleasure seek the, um, we seek the pleasure that reflects our values. Also, philosophers said that pleasure is neither good or bad. It's about how we incorporate it in our lives and concerns. And from Aristotle, um, in the book of rhetoric, I get some ideas that, for example, um, and also the book of poetics, a skillful ima imitation and capability of creating things causes pleasure. And also he says that delight emerges when we, um, when we draw um, inferences and learn something fresh about the, crea um, about the creation, not just by contemplating what we create, right? And from marketing, we have like this like, um, like well-known model, the, um, the, um, the user satisfaction model, uh, customer satisfaction model, that you know, we have like some requirements that are implied, self-evident, not expressed, and obvious, so we must fulfill these requirements because like, the consumer is expecting that. But then, you know, we can learn from them that this needs to be fulfilled as well, but there's some other like, you know, like, um, requirements that are not expressed, that are like, you know, like, very particular to um, that moment, and those are like um, the ones that cause light. So that's a like well-known model um, from marketing, the Kano model. And also like some scholars of marketing, they say that you know, there are like three types of delight. Um, assimilated, that delight that once we experience it is our standard. So for the next type of experience, the similar experience, we're expecting something like that. The reenacted, um, that type of delight in which we try to do the same or like set the same conditions to experience delight again. Or the transitory delight um, that, you know, 
the delight that we experience, and once we experience it, hmm, we don't care about that anymore, and then we move on. Also, um, marketing scholars say um, that delight does not necessarily involve surprise. In some cases, we can really feel joy, and that's connected to delight. Um, but sometimes it's about like, you know, this magical moment, that spark, and that's delight, but it's not the same um, as real joy. And from product design, which uh, we know now in HCI because you know we moved to this like a way that is like focused on um, the notion of experience. We know now that usability is insufficient to address you know people's needs. I mean the so-called the hedonic turn. And from that um, domain, I'm considering you know Jordan's um, framework, um, the four pleasures. The physical pleasure, the social pleasure, the psycho pleasure, and the ideal pleasure. Basically, you know, like, like through our senses, social interactions, um, our cognition um, um, capabilities, and, uh, you know, and like values is the last one. And, of course, we have, you know, what Norman has said about emotional design, you know, like the visceral, behavioral, and reflective levels of emotional design, um, what are cons which are concerned with, you know, like our gut reactions, you know, like using the thing, or, you know, like how we think about, how we think about the thing, like, you know, like in the future. And I'm from Hecker that pleasure, we get pleasure when the design object helps us to adapt to a situation, to survive um, in some extent, to some extent. So, but what are like the UX practitioners um, saying about the light? So a micro study that I did is like basically going, um, I went to Medium and like, like check like many articles um, from these practitioners um, about delight and pleasure. And one thing that I, wanna, I want to point out is that, you know, um, there's a lot of like, you know, concepts that, you know, they come from um, scholarly work, but practitioners, they don't acknowledge that explicitly. And there's like some like theoretical development we think and this model in particular is quite popular. So probably you've seen this model before, that you know, we need this system to be functional, reliable, usable, and also pleasurable. And just to be fast, um, you can divide um, the discourse from UX practitioners into big themes. And one is delight as a appearance and motion, and the other one is delight as fulfillment and efficiency. So some people say that it's important to pay, you know, attention to the formal aspects of, you know, the interface. And other people say, you know what? If you really want to be delightful, you have to be super functional. I mean, you have to like go in these like scales um, or levels of the pyramid if you really want to be delightful. Um, but from all these ideas that you can see from the UX practitioners, I want to um, emphasize these ones. So it's, um, it comes from a post um, from the Nielsen Norman group, and that's why I'm, like, I'm pointing this out, because you know they have a lot of influence of like, what we say um, about interaction design and how we think of, about interaction design, because you know it's Nielsen and Norman. Um, so first and then, um, she defines delight as this. It says, user delight refers to any positive emotional effect that a user may have when interacting with a device or interface. User delight may not always be expressed hourly, but can influence, uh, can influence the behaviors and opinions formulated while using a website or application. So she basically synthesizes you know, what other like, practitioners are saying about the life. And she also considers that, you know, there's some, it's something related to appearance, and it's something related, you know, like to functionality. And she elevates this part, which I don't agree completely. I think that both are important, and this has value as well. So that's something I want to say. Um, but, okay, how am I going to use rhetoric to, like, like frame or, like, talk <coughs> about the life? So, the, uh, rhetoric is a, com it's a complicated term, like, you know, it has a lot of, like, meaning and it's not, like, simple to define sometimes. And I just want us to keep in mind, like, these um, ideas from Bissell um, 
and Herzberg, they say, rhetoric has a number of overlapping meanings. It's the practice of oratory, the study of the strategies of effective oratory, the use of language, written or spoken, to inform or persuade, the study of persuasive effects of language, the study of the relation between language and knowledge, the classification and use of tropes and figures, and of course, the use of empty promises and half-truth as a form of propaganda. So with all these ideas of rhetoric, um, I, I was wondering, okay, so we have creation of interactive systems that comes from a design language so, because it's a form of language or a type of language, it may be a, you know, we can study through rhetoric. Um, but where to start? Well, we have to be clear about how, how we consider rhetoric in this case. Three definitions that I consider or take into account, like, you know, two are like, you know, from classical rhetoric. This is basically by Aristotle, and this is like from contemporary rhetoric. So, Aristotle says that rhetoric is a counterpart of dialectic. And just by saying that, you're making a connection um, between rhetoric and argumentation. It's not like a, you know, a trickery or like a deceiving you know, practice. Um, he also says that rhetoric is the ability of observing in any given case the available means of persuasion. So that means that persuasion is not the ultimate goal of rhetoric. It's that you have to be ready to detect and understand you know, when in the situation you can persuade. And now, you know, um, uh, a current definition is just like this. Rhetoric is the human use of symbols to communicate, period. So how do I apply rhetoric um, to analyze interfaces? So with all these, you know, like background, basically what I do is to study rhetoric and then, you know, study a subdomain of rhetoric and then take some concepts that I use as a lens to analyze or inspect an, an artifact. So I try you know, to understand some compositional qualities or exponential qualities you know, based on, on the perspective of this lens. And in, in the process, you know, trying to provide a language for interaction design. My method is not only influenced by rhetorical criticism, um, it's also like influenced by the semiotic inspection method defined within semiotic engineering. So basically it's like um, the expert-based method within this theory of XTI, and also the practice of interaction criticism by Marcel and Marcel, which is like, you know, a key method within humanistic XTI. So the lenses that I have explored um, are these ones, so like, are like concepts from rhetoric, and I've used them, you know, like to like talk about these compositional qualities or experiential qualities. So basically what I do is like something like this. So given an interface component or a group of interface components, like either static components or like dynamic components, I try to see how a micro interaction affects the system or, you know, you do the interaction flow and the result of the, um, that you get from there but particularly what I'm trying to see is like how the combination of these elements, you know, under the perspective of this lens, you know, generate meaning to the user and underlying meaning. So that's, this is the overview of what I do as a researcher. For example, um, we have this notion of um, a rhetorical argument, the enthymy. And this is a, you know, a typical example of the enthymy. So you have Socrates is human, therefore mortal. So that means that you omit this part. And when you say this out loud, the audience has to fill in this you know, like missing part. And that's when the engagement you know, between audience and speaker occurs. And of course, the speaker has to, you know, draw on the experiential knowledge, predisposition, and everything that the audience has, you know, like, to, like, complete this game, you know? So I, I was wondering, well, I wondered, can we do that in interactive systems? This is the reason why I'm, I, I'm, I care about that, because this happens in graphic design. 
So this is an example of a visual argument. Here we can conclude um, that we are the same because you know behind or beneath our skin. You know, it doesn't matter how we look um, from the exterior. So I was wondering whether um, interactive systems, you know, have a similar role or effect. And one example um, that I have studied is this app um, by Adam Nasri called Gaza Everywhere, in which you put, you know, the name of your city, and it shows you the strip of Gaza, and you can see, you know, how, it, you know, the extension of the strip of Gaza overlap in your city. And from my analysis, um, I argue that this is a form of a uh, type of interactive anything. Because when you type an artwork and you see this, it's not you know that you're seeing just like the images and that's it, overlapping. It's that you can connect your own experiences with this image. You know how it might feel to be in the strip of gas. You know how grand it could be, or how spacious it could be, how you know what it would mean, you know, going from this point to this point in your, as part of your everyday life. So in that sense, you're completing or you're filling in the unstated, you know, like premises. So that's how an example of an interactive anthem. And based on this study, what I'm, I want to point out or emphasize is that when we design an interactive system, we usually think in this, um, about this space, but now, thanks to technology, the interactive system can help the user, you know, because in the case of Gaza Everywhere, you can publish, it, um, publish your results on Twitter, so you can influence other people, and this ecosystem or network, as whatever you want to call it, influences the discourse of the situation, and that will affect you as a designer. <laughs> So, yeah, I think it was going too fast, but okay. So, how do I connect all these things um, with the notion of delight? Well, I'm now introducing to you like this idea of interaction delight, which is basically a synthesis of my work. So, all the aspects that I'm taking from philosophy, marketing, product design, and human-computer interaction, I'm taking these ones and I'm combining them with, like, you know, my readings um, or investigations on rhetoric, or what rhetoric is and means, um, or work in different contexts, and you know, the insights I gained from my rhetorical explorations. So I put everything together in a blender, and then um, bring an interpretation, um, a rhetorical interpretation of delight, which I call um, interaction delight. So, what is this? Um, rhetorical aspect, where is the rhetorical aspect of interaction delight? Well, I'm claiming here that delight in interactive systems is rhetorical in the sense that it comes from a rhetorical action. So it's something that you as a designer, you're intentionally trying to do, you're trying to achieve. Um, you know, and it's experienced rhetorically by the user, which means that when you, you, you experience it, it will change your perception about the system, perhaps the performance of what it means for your life, right? So, in this idea, we, um, derived from this connection of delight and rhetoric, I, I pose it, you know, like this type of framework, like two ways or two lenses to talk about delight. Um, these are the argumentative strength and the expressive um, strength of interaction delight. So the argumentative one is basically when you're trying to combine these elements, you are the designer, um, to create um, something enthematic or something like a multimodal argument. Because, and of course, you're trying to draw on the um, user's um, um, experiential knowledge and expectations of, uh, for future or regarding future actions. So what does the user experience from my perspective what she does is um, to identify a vivid image from, the, from interactions from the system, with the system. And it's that moment when you feel pleasure, but you can say why the system is supporting that like, pleasurable um, moment, right? 
is that moment when you can see how these systems functionality and behavior um, allows you to feel you know delight to be delighted um, for example um, here like you know if you have a, a budget for your trip and you like browsing Gaia and then you see this aspect or you know step by step you're seeing how it goes you know or once you have the result you feel that it's because it's this result this type of like you know um, vivid image is um, making sense to the expectations that you have for your trip so you can articulate ask I mean as a user you can articulate why you know like this is something good for you or here, you know, um, like, you know, like, like, okay, sorry for that. Here, this system is basically trying to say, like, you know what? I'm giving you, I'm supporting you, I give you the means, you know, for you to travel when you're with your restricted budget. Or here, something that this is new because it was released this week um, is the case of the Friendship Award, which is basically a way of um, that Facebook is using to tell us, you know. It's good that you're a good friend. It's good that you like use Facebook, Facebook, you know, like to interact with your friends. Here's a way for you to acknowledge that and tell everyone that you agree with this. So my point here is that the system communicates a type of argument, and you, as the user, you can understand how the um, design is supporting that argument. But in some cases, depending on who you are or what you need or what you're trying to do that will, you know, give you a moment of pleasure. And the expressive strength of delight is that, you know, when the designer is trying, you know, to cause a deviation of meaning, or trying, you know, to bring a, um, something unconventional regarding the interface components or interactions. So what the, um, the user feels, from my perspective, is um, that, you know, she identifies this vivid image but you know, that image is like connected to this unexpected implementation, an unexpected symbolic relationship of the system that is kind of new for us, you know, I mean, users. Um, and that moment causes, you know, like high pleasure, enchantment, amusement, captivation, or surprise. And for example, here, like, we don't have a play button. So when we in bank, this is bank. Remember bank? <laughs> so when you like a, <laughs> when you like hover on the image, the you know the video starts playing. That's an unexpected implementation. That is <gasps> oh, you see, it's that moment of <gasps> because you know it's something that is unusual. You don't need a button anymore, and it's you know, okay now. It reminds you okay, this is how bank works. Or here in this case, the um, so-called uh, text likes from Facebook. It's not the thing that, from my perspective, is causing the light only. It's that this thing, the hyperlink, um, uh, its meaning has changed. It's not that it's going to take you to a different place. It's that now if you click, you stay in the same place, and something happens in that place. It's a new implementation for the notion of hyperlink. So with all these ideas, what I'm trying to say is that we have two sides of interaction in that. One is that this is super focused on the designer, and the other one is on the user. So one I call, this one I call intended interaction delight, and this one I call experience interaction delight. And if we consider the designer's side, it's about you know, um, a configuration of the oral, the visual, the tactile, the temporal, um, these five modes. It's about like, you know, creating unexpected implementations. It's about like finding a way to make our system to work as a multimodal argument or like to try to argue by the user experience and trying to, you know, to fulfill one of these functions of rhetoric. And if we are the user, um, interaction delight means, you know, grasping a vivid image um, during interaction time and that image, you know, will cause an assimilated, reenacted, or transitory type of delight. And in we the users, we can also always tell, you know, how the system is, you know, generating this pleasure. And a third one, which is the play I role and I invite others, others to play, is the, you know, the role of the researcher. So here, 
you consider this space as an object of study. So you want to study the argumentative and the expressive strengths of delight. And you know, and try to see how the deviation of meaning you know, generates delight in terms of our um, appropriateness, style, clarity, correctness, and ornamentation. So, the takeaways or the things I want us to take um, today with us is um, first, a definition of what interaction delight means. So, interaction delight is a bilateral quality of interactive systems. The design of, the intera of interaction delight implies for the designer to leverage the relationships between the visual, the oral, the verbal, the tactile, and the temporal modes to please, charm, and shun, captivate, amuse, divert, entertain, arouse, or surprise the user. On the side of the user, interaction delight implies to encounter a captivating, arousing, or surprising brief period during interactions with the system mostly due to an unexpected implementation regarding the functionality and behavior of an interface component. And why to consider rhetoric, or what I want us to consider from rhetoric, is that, okay, rhetoric involves persuasion. However, it has more functions. I want us to keep in mind that, you know, it's about also like um, identification, inviting to understanding, helping, you know, in, in self-discovery and self-knowledge, and also like a way to shape reality. So based on that perspective, I, like one way that we can talk and think about HCI is that, you know, it's, it's like shaping symbolic compositions whose meaning has an impact on the user's everyday lives, okay? Like, sorry. And, you know, what this season is like fulfilling, you know, one of these um, rhetorical functions. So, particularly when we combine rhetoric and delight, um, I think that, yeah, delight can like, help us to, um, rhetoric can help us to talk, help us talk about delight. So rhetoric allows us to establish a connection between delight and multimodal argumentation, and rhetoric gives us a lens to inspect um, the communicative, communicative role of delight in HCI. Okay, that's it. Thank you. So, question. <laughs> Robin, yeah. I can be more paced now. I was like very excited <laughs> about this talk. Okay, sorry for that. Excuse me. As a researcher or even a designer, how can we measure delight when we're you know, talking yeah. to users? So, how do we know? You know, yeah, I, 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 knew that, I knew that someone was going to ask me that. So that's why I, I present, you know, like um, in the beginning, like, you know, that space. Because usually when we think of SCI, you know, we have the behavioral approach. So that means that, you know, we want to measure the reactions of the user, you know, when they are exposed to these delightful, you know, like designs, right? But what I'm saying here is that that's not the only way, that's not the only way um, of doing this. You can also go and try with other, like, you know, perspectives. So here we have a you know, humanities part, and you know they say, for example, you can generate knowledge, and you can triangulate later, but you can generate knowledge, you know, by doing criticism. So that's what I mentioned that my method is influenced in part from interaction criticism, but also from the side of semiotic engineering. There is this also I created this method, which is also a form of criticism somehow, also to generate knowledge. So in other words, the part I'm addressing is the qualitative part. It, you know, expert-based qualitative side. Mm -hmm. So I can generate knowledge based on this type of analysis, but if you want to complement it or you want to triangulate it, then we bring the quantitative scientific part. What if it's also qualitative but not expert-based? Oh, that's also valid. Yeah, you know, like, for example, that's more traditional, like, as we do in design research, that I made a prototype, you know, it's supposed to be delightful, or we, like, grab interaction, um, Facebook delights, I mean, and then make, like, some, some observations on some sort of web, um, interviews. Yeah. So we can do that as well. You see? So the part I'm bringing here is a third leg on this, you know, like, 
you can do the interviews or observation, or you can go from the quantitative side. So this is the critical side. Okay? Yeah. You have any other questions, Matt? <laughs> um, I, so you, you made a sort of side comment uh, somewhere there on uh, sort of surface delight versus deep delight when you're talking about the, the yeah. and norm and stuff. I wonder if you could unpack that a little bit. You sort of said they are oh. more interested in this deep delight related to functionality. Um, you don't necessarily agree with that so, perspective, so I wanted you to kind of unpack that a little bit. So what happens is that practitioners are following this model and they believe that you have to be functional, reliable, usable, and then think about like the reservoir thing. In the philosophical... In a philosophical side of it, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that is this division between body and mind that, you know, like things, appearance is not as valuable as function. So this is the thing. She says basically surface delight is, you know, like the, um, the written text of the interfaces, the appearance of the buttons. So, okay, that's good. That's delight. But the good one is the deeply delight that, you know, the system should work and look great. And after that, you will feel delight. So as a person who comes from the School of Art and Design, I, when I was trying to say that there's value here. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not that this goes above this one from my perspective, or they go like this, or they go like this. They're intertwined. Yeah. Because when you generate, you know, like the appearance of a button, or like um, define how it's going to behave, um, you're already thinking about the functionality of disability somehow. You know, it's not that you're like, okay, this is the function of the system, and now I'm going to think about, like, you know, like the the appearance of this style, or like, you know? And that happens a lot um, in the traditional approach to HCI, perhaps, because, you know, it's like this. I'm going to design the wireframes, and I'm going to design the interaction flows, and then I'm going to give that to my the graphic designer just to make it pretty. Yeah. <laughs> I don't believe it works like that. So that's my point. OK? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Andre? This is awesome. Thank you for doing this. Really Thank you. To have sat in on it. Um, I have a couple of comments and then a question. So, as a rhetorician, it seems to me that you may have conflated, I'm sorry, may have compressed delight on top of a rhetorical critical approach. Um, and it's not really a fair accusation without having gone through your process, but it strikes me that rhetoric does, while rhetoric accommodates persuasion, rhetoric is about persuasion, it's not so much interested in delight at all. That seems to be a quality of affect. Right. Yeah. Right. And yeah. Right. And so that's one comment. The other comment is based on my uh, very bare knowledge of HCI. Where does affordance fit into this rhetorical question? Right. And so this rhetorical inquiry into what the artifact does. And so in the ways you almost leave it too open ended, where delight can originate from any space. So then I would like. So how can trolls delight from this particular? Uh, interface, right? Uh -huh. So if you look at Reddit and people who are doing trolling, they get just as much joy from downvoting, which is a function of the site, as other people do from upvoting, right? Or upvoting in, uh, offensive content. So the affordances of the site seem to me to have some space, need to have some space in this conceptualization of how delight works as a rhetorical element for interface design. Okay, right? got it now. Okay. So the question which is kind of unrelated to either of the comments, just, just working through it, uh -huh. but this is, you know. Um, how does, would you consider this a hermeneutic approach to mm. interface design? Yeah. Right, and this actually kind of sort of goes back to the affordance. So by hermeneutic, I mean that you're considering all the elements that the, the interface will interact, will exist in, in context. So you had a slide yeah. where you had kayak on one side and a mobile interface of something on the other side. And I was struggling because I know that the types of interactions I'm looking for on Kayak are very different than I would even look for on Kayak on the desktop are different from Kayak on the mobile browser. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was struggling to figure out what context I should understand delight emerging from depending on the function of the site, the purpose that I'm going to it for, the elements that are available, even yeah. the type of interface that the user mm -hmm. is enacting. And to me that sounds like a hermeneutics. Yeah. Right? Okay. Point. Yeah. Okay, Sorry, so the question is if it's somehow a hermeneutic approach. Is there, would you consider this a hermeneutic approach? And if so, how, so these guys, I'm assuming you guys are all interface designers or HCI people. How could they apply a hermeneutics okay. right, to this particular thing? Okay, yeah, okay. You got all the points. 
and I'm not <laughs> because this is the thing. So you have you have the humanistic side, and you have like you know like criticism slash like hermeneutic analysis as one way to generate knowledge. And I agree with you. I mean, here I'm the expert, and of course I assume the context and all that stuff. So if I have to explain that better, I have to write those things down, right? So the issue that we have here in SCI is that how you teach that to people who has a scientific background or like not accustomed to that type of thing. So what I'm proposing is to introduce, um, you know, first, that's why I didn't mention the word hermeneutic. I, when I talk about it, I, take, I say interpretive analysis instead. Um, like the notion of argument. So the, like what I'm trying to like tell the ACI people is that what if you think of the system as a multimodal argument? That's something that makes more sense because you know, oh, arguments, logic, yeah, perfect. And that opens the door to rhetoric. Because if I come with rhetoric right away, it's like, oh, it's persuasion, it's persuasive technology, it's about changing my behavior, you know, I'm going to stop smoking or lose weight. And that's not what I'm looking for with this. It's more like, you know, okay, how, if you understand, like, you know, how images influence your everyday life, how, like, you know, the building influence your, you know, influences your, your, like, activity right now, can you do the same with, like, a systems? So what lens you should bring? You know, like, the background is basically the, um, rhetoric. The lenses are the ones I have, I have explored. In this case, I'm the one who has done it. But if I have to teach it, I mean, I have to teach somehow, like, you know, the background, what the lenses mean, you know, and like how I did it, you know, how I performed, like, you know, like, um, like this part, you know. So I'm getting, I'm getting like a, so my point is that delight in this case is that, you know, also like to push the idea because, you know, okay, you have rhetoric and then what? So delight is something that, you know, designers are, are concerned or care about. So, okay, so if you have delight here, and you say that we can analyze interfaces from this critical perspective, is there a way we can put them together? And that's the reason because I'm showing this. You see? And of course, because you can perform like this type of analysis without addressing the light. But in this case, for this project, these were pushed to see how the insights I came from doing this can tell me to reframe or rearticulate what other people have said about the light. Is kind of kind of clear? Yes. Can I follow up? Yeah. So, rhetoric, one of the definitions you had from Gisela Hersberg, good, good choice by the way, um, was that rhetoric is a science per of persuasion. Persuasion is always about the influence, using power to influence somebody to make a decision that they informally would yeah. like to make. Right? So, how do you distinguish this approach from the Skinner Box methods that game designers are using to encourage users to do microtransactions? Right? So you're talking about the light, mm -hmm. right? They're trading on um, addiction. Is an addiction a form of delight? How do you make the ethical difference yeah. between the coercion you're asking these guys to design into a thing and the ways in which there are already behavioral techniques inherent in game and interface design yeah. in order to addict people to, to use the interface over and over? Yeah, that's a very good point, and I think that connects to Robin's question. So I haven't thought about that. Because one thing that is tacit there or implicit is that I do care a lot about like the design part. So, for example, in the case of um, what the case that you just mentioned, you know, you're drawing from I guess like the psychology, um, you know, oriented like you know insights to build the game because you know that. But in my case, I do care about um, like you know like what it means you know like to shape a button. You know, what it means to like, you know, like to like make the, um, you know, an image, you know, making it work as a button perhaps. Mm -hmm. So that's the type like, you know, like emphasis I'm like uh, trying to do or like giving in with these ideas. That is not that I'm trying to implement, you know, like, a, like, you know, like, a, like, for example, the, the example that you gave, like, you know, from, from these games, um, it's more I'm trying to understand the design and the aspects, you know, what, what it means to design, you know. I don't know, that's what I mentioned, the word poetics. That's something blurred in, at this moment in my work, but definitely, yeah. However, before you go, I, yeah, I agree with your, um, I agree with that, and I guess that's the part missing in my work, that like, you know, for example, yeah. Okay, now you go. Oh, Andre, no, I thought you were going to say something else. I, I have one more. Right. Okay, yeah, yeah. Nobody else wants to ask questions, but I can't. Oh, yeah. Go for it, go for it. Um, so, it seems like during this talk, you focused mostly on um, 
delight as this like pleasurable surprise kind of feeling. But uh, I'll on to the previous talking about um, surface delight versus deep delight. I was wondering how you would talk about um, delight in uh, interfaces that are interfaces of tools like using Photoshop or things like that. How where is where is the delight in, in, in that? Because you don't want as much like surprise there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's that's what I mentioned at a certain point that um for example with that idea from marketing that sometimes it involves surprise and sometimes it doesn't. What I focus on on more I mean is this notion of deviation of meaning. So instead of talking about surprise, when I was reading uh, things about metaphorical tensions and all that stuff Deviation of meaning is something that, oh, maybe this is the aspect I want to like uh, convey. So for example, if you have a new interface in Photoshop, it's not that it's going to surprise you. Um, maybe you as the designer, I mean, you're going to like give, okay, this is a good example. One case that I consider as this deviation of meaning is, um, you know, the buttons on Instagram. So you have a button that, um, first, it doesn't look like a button, like in the old days. And second, you can do more than one thing with the same widget. So that's something new. That's, a, that's what I call deviation of meaning, or deviation of what you're expecting to do with the interface component. So not necessarily it would surprise me, but there's a like, twist there that the designer did on purpose. And I think that if you know, like if you like, for example, when I say, oh, it connects with the things I want to do, or it connects, you know, like a, with my gut reaction, you know, okay, that's kind of delight. So in summary, not surprised necessarily, but like, let's see what happens if we talk about the deviation of me. Okay, so this still seems very ephemeral, ephemeral, where if you keep using this tool, like you will, or using any interface, it seems like if it doesn't change, you would have, by this definition, like less delight as you go on. Yeah, I, I see. I guess that that's the part, like, you know, it's about how we're going to measure that effectively is delight or delightful or not. Is that, is that your concern? Um, no, just like the, the definition of delight and how, how designing specifically for delight, it seems like you're always chasing delight then. If you're saying like, okay, if we're, we're designing specifically so the user has more delight and more delight, you're, and when the user uses it more and more often, you're like, oh, well, I'm not oh, delighted okay. as, as often because I, I've experienced yeah. all these things before yeah. and these twists already met. No, and that's, that's a thing, but, okay. So remember that discussion, for example, when you have, are you designing you, um, user experience or you design for user experience? It's somehow like that. So what I'm saying is that you design aiming at, getting, at causing some delight, but as Andre say, like, you know, once it's there, it doesn't depend on you anymore. So what I'm doing here, I mean, Omar is doing here, is just basically taking existing objects to articulate how these things could be or can be delightful, you know? But that's, again, it's like, you know, it's a critical reading on a thing that, you know, that is trying to explain things, putting words that you can use later and maybe complement or triangulate with other stuff. But I cannot say, I, and, I don't, and I don't believe that anyone can say that because I designed it this way, it's going to be delightful 100% of the times. That's very, I, I don't believe that. I believe more that you know, once you design your thing, that is an ultimate particular, as Eric Stolderman says, you know, that it, 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 it embodies somehow, like, you know, a situation, but once you put it out there, like the interaction with this cup for each of us is going to be different. So that's kind of my take on it. Actually, the gentleman in the back here has a good comment. Like, that's, that ephemerality is something that's designed for as well. So I think in terms of Microsoft Word, which I use all the time, and when they change the functions on the ribbon on the micro on Microsoft Word, once you have it in built into your muscle mind memory, that delight becomes part of your cognitive schema, and any interruption of it is not delightful, right? Yeah. And so the delight it's not necessarily ephemeral. I think I think that's why I was asking about the definition of delight because you have to include that habitual use that people come to associate with a smooth flow. Right, that, that works for delight as well. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, know what, I know what all of you mean, and I, 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 I want to make clear that what I just said, like, you know, I do not claim that there's a, like a way to design, design for delight that is going to be to cause the same effect all the time, because that's, you need to consider that this is what you can do as a designer, it's a non-scientific way of like shaping something unexistent. 
And this is what you're trying to do, the, you know, like the intended character, as Hasenstein calls it. But once it's out there, you know, each situation is particular. So, you know, I can interact with Instagram, you know, based, based on the previous example here, and I won't have the same effect. Or maybe it's different from, this, from the first time. So that, that, what I would call humanistic slash critical slash non-scientific perspective, to talk about like these things we design, that's the idea I'm like bringing here to us. That if we're so accustomed to like thinking in terms of like, you know, it has to be systematized and it can be always measurable and it can be always like, you know, like a person, you know, like very engineering, you know, design or the design of many things. I mean, doesn't, don't work like that. Or doesn't work like that. That's how I think about design. Yeah, Andre. <laughs> so you made a comment. I'm sorry, this is fine. Uh, you made a comment about you're interested as a designer in perhaps getting that one button perfectly placed or perfectly uh, uh, shaped so that it elicits an emotion for the user. And I was thinking of that in terms of the recent uh, California Supreme Court decision where they ruled against Tinder's age discrimination pricing scheme. I don't know if you're aware of it. Mm -hmm. In the ruling, they said that we prefer to swipe to the right and reject this particular ruling. Okay. Right. So, but, but, so here you have the, all they did was all the tender engineers did was design this feature. But at some point, these features become so much a part of our lexicon. Now you have Supreme Court using. So I always urge designers to think past part what you may think is just a small element of the system, but that element may become so much a part of our cultural vernacular that it has wider effects mm -hmm. than than just that button does. Yeah. I mean, that's part of what I was when I introduced the Tinder thing, but now that you're mention, mentioning that, that's an example. Um, because, you know, I study, for example, Facebook, and then I generate a document with my essay saying that this is like the, the experiential qualities I detect from my perspective based on this lens. Now you came and, like, you know, introduce a new artifact, and you will have your own report. And isn't that the way rhetoric works? So we don't have a universal, general, general, generalizable knowledge because you know each case is different, and the mission of, in this case, the research slash rhetorician or slash hermeneutic researcher, whatever you want to call it, is like you know to generate a piece that also will be immersed in a certain context. So that type of thinking and acknowledging that that's knowledge. That's something also that I believe that if we come from a computer science or scientific background, it's kind of difficult to accept sometimes. And it's something I also want to like give here as a takeaway. Yeah. Thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, so this is it's, it's just one perspective, and I wonder that now you, if you like thinking that it may work or it may be, it can or it doesn't work, it's because again, like you know, maybe there's something in your like a predisposition and experiential knowledge that you know is like causing a gap there. So I don't know. Yeah. I will say for y'all, because I can't stop talking, uh, that I have an information science PhD. So I'm coming from both sides of this question, right? Uh, I, I fully believe that a critical approach to information uh, analysis is not a humanistic, it is a informational and critical approach. To, uh, and I come from the critical frame of social informatics to make that argument. So this okay. is something, it's not necessarily measurable, but it's something that's definitely important to the type of work that we do. There we do, okay. Cool, thanks. And um, we need that coffee now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> more. Yeah. Okay. So sorry for being so um, hasty and like fast in the beginning, but I wanted to have time. And um, I guess the summary of all of this is that um, let's think that like everything is rhetorical to some extent, any type of design. And uh, you know, like the light has this persuasive effect, but also other effects that you know, and that allow us to connect it to rhetoric. And that um, and that. There's always like space for like interpretive slash hermeneutic analysis in our discipline, you know, to triangulate with other quantitative or qualitative more um, structured approaches. Okay, thank you.